So good afternoon. This is the House Health Care Committee again, and it's uh, February 4th. It's two in the afternoon. Let me just put a frame around what we're going to be doing this afternoon. This morning, we today we're spending the entire day on understanding important aspects of the Vermont's mental health system of care. This morning, we spent a great deal of time with the Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner of mental, the Department of Mental Health. We were scheduled to hear from Julie Tesler and One Care, which are not One Care, One uh, Care Partners, uh, which uh, represents the designated agencies uh, in the mental health system. And because of the time pressures of the morning, we uh, and Julie, with Julie's agreement, we moved her testimony to tomorrow afternoon, after the floor. No, after the at one at one fifteen, because we have no floor tomorrow afternoon. The floor is in the morning. So again, for those who may have looked at our previous agenda, Julie Tesler's testimony will be tomorrow afternoon at 1.15. And so this afternoon, we are going to continue our uh, understanding of some significant aspects of the mental health system of care in Vermont. And this afternoon, we're pleased to have with us uh, representatives from a number of community partner organizations and stakeholders. Um, I'm going to run through the list of folks, and then we're going to uh, we'll start first by hearing uh, first from the uh, Center for Health and Learning uh, and its um, its director Joelle Joellen Tarello. Uh, and they also do a lot of work with Vermont suicide prevention under uh, contracts and grants. Uh, we also have with us Dan, and I'm not sure Dan if I get your name right, Toll, uh, but uh, who is with a peer support staff member um, and a member of the state program standing committee. Then we, we have uh, Lori em Emerson, uh, who's the executive director of NAMI Vermont, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, Kareem Chapman, executive director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors and AJ Rubin with Disability Rights Vermont. Um, so we're gonna start from, with hearing from uh, the Center for Health and Learning. And we're going to ask each presenter to take maybe you know ten minutes most in the outside to describe your programming, and then leave some time for questions, so that we get a chance to hear from everybody uh, in the course of the time we have this afternoon. So welcome, Joellen. Thank you know, I'd welcome you to introduce yourself and maybe properly correct my pronunciation of your full name. Very good, Honorable Chair and Vice Chair and Representatives of the House Committee on Healthcare. Thank you for the invitation to speak today about what our concerns related to mental health and suicide prevention are for Vermont. Uh, I'm Dr. Joellen Tarallo, I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Health and Learning and Director of the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center, a public-private partnership. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. If this meets the needs of the committee, I would like to accomplish three things. One is to provide a data-based answer to the question as to whether the COVID epidemic gives us cause for concern with regard to mental health and suicide issues, challenges. Uh, second, to establish what populations are at higher risk and three, to promote the strategies that have been identified by the Vermont Suicide Prevention Coalition over the course of many meetings and in collaboration with the Department of Mental Health. We have over 10 years of continuous attendance of more than 40 members at each meeting, representing the concerns of people with lived experience and representatives of state agency and partner organizations. So when I speak, I do not speak on behalf of myself alone, uh, however, on behalf of this coalition. Uh, shall I proceed then with those priorities? Please do. Okay. Um, the first question is, does COVID gives up, give us cause for concern? And after a thorough review of the literature based on what we've learned from studies done on past quarantine and public health emergencies, including SARS, H1N1, Ebola, Spanish flu, and MERS? The answer is yes. Uh, effects of quarantine include higher incidence of many mental health related conditions. There were reductions in anxiety four to six months after quarantine ended, um, which gives us some uh, pause for uh, hope that we can address this in a very systematic way. 
And it is true that prolonged quarantines may be associated with PTSD symptoms and depression up to three years post quarantine. Another question, are children at higher risk for mental health challenges? Yes, uh, as a result of the pandemic that is. During SARS, PTSD scores of children were four times higher than those not in quarantine. Another question, are healthcare workers at higher risk of mental health challenges as well as our essential workers? The answer to that is yes. Those who worked in healthcare and experienced the virus suffered increased stress levels, negative mental health effects, including depression and PTSD at three year follow up versus the general public. And there was also an association with alcohol use dependency symptoms in those who were working at high risk locations and quarantined. Another question, are older adults at risk of suicide? This is generally the case with older adults um, due to a lack of social engagement, anxiety, and stress. Um, these are all predisposing factors, uh, feelings of loneliness and disconnectedness and being a burden on family members. Um, and that was true for all the research during uh, these pandemics. They were likely associated with an increase in suicide of older adults. Is the general public at risk? Yes, suffering from the outbreak is associated with increased stress, fear, anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. PTSD and depression were the most prevalent psychiatric condition at 30 months post outbreak. So uh, moving on from previous pandemics with regard to mental health and COVID, the CDC reported in June that 40% of US adults were struggling with mental health or substance use and were experiencing increased negative mental health conditions associated with COVID. Younger adults, minorities, Hispanic and black and essential workers are disproportionately suffering from adverse mental health outcomes, increased substance use and elevated suicidal ideation. The rise in mental illness attributed to the pandemic is actually greater than expected. Three times the number of Americans suffering from depression um, now before, than before the pandemic began. We saw an 890% increase in call volume to the disaster distress helpline in April 2020 compared with the previous April. In Vermont, the number of Vermonters dying by suicide and ED visits for suicidal ideation and or self-harm in 2021, 2020 and 21 are actually similar to previous years. However, the overall percentage of those visits for suicidal ideation and self-harm have increased from past years. Our LGBTQ and BIPOC students of uh, Black, uh, Indigenous, and people of color are at very high risk in Vermont, with 36% of our LGBT students saying that they've made a suicide plan, compared to 13% of students overall making a suicide plan. And for those attempting suicide, 7% of students overall attempted suicide, 10% of our Black Indigenous people of color in Vermont students attempted suicide, and 19% of our LGBTQ students attempted suicide. Effects of school closures on mental health and suicide, and this is national information now, um, cannot be conclusively linked. The rise in youth and adult, young adult suicides, which has been steadily increasing over 20 years, cannot be conclusively linked to school closures. Uh, emergency calls related to mental health have increased in 40 states for all age groups. And some districts throughout the country are reporting suicide clusters. Um, and there is an emphasis on connecting students with resources. We know that students are missing the social nexus that school offers 
and experts fear that suicide rates for youth and young adults may increase since due to school closures, they're becoming isolated from friends and trusted adults at school. And home is where youth and young adults often have the most access to firearms. Uh, every town noted that gun sales doubled throughout the US from March to July when compared with the previous year. And coupled with an overall trend in increased deaths by suicide among youth using firearms, 51% increase in firearm suicides in those ages 15 to 24 in the decade ending in 2018. And of particular concern, um, and we, we hear about concern of suicidal ideation among elementary students quite a bit and are adapting our You Matter Suicide Prevention Program down to the elementary school level, uh, is an increase of 214% rate of suicide among 10 to 14 year olds by firearm um, in 2018. Is there an increase in youth suicide due to COVID? Um, they have been rising over the year and currently there is no evidence that the pandemic has led to an overall spike in suicide rates for youth. We have all been working, many of us nationally uh, and in Vermont to address this rate. And there is one um, newly released um, by the Department of Mental Health data that I would like to uh, share with you as I start to talk with you about the coalitions identified by the Vermont Suicide Prevention Coalition. And is it possible to share a screen quickly? Yes, I think, I think that can be arranged by our assistant. Okay, if you could just make me a co-host for a moment. Yes, you should be able to share Okay, there we go. How does that, can you see a graph? Yes. So Alison Krampf, uh, who I believe you've perhaps uh, had testimony from, Director of Quality yeah. Improvement, okay, at Department of Mental Health just shared this with me this morning. And this is percent of suicide deaths who were served by a DA, a designated mental health agency, within the previous year. And what we see here is what I consider a very favorable downward trend from 2012, and we initiated our zero suicide efforts, which is suicide safer care with designated agencies in 2014 and 15. So right about when there was a spike, um, down, it, downward trend to 2020. Now we have no idea uh, if this is the uh, attributing factor. Right now we have seven of our 12 designated mental health agencies participating in the Zero Suicide 2020-21 project. A lot of this is due to capacity and due to resources to properly fund such an initiative. Um, I can unshare now and go back to just a few final speaking points. And let me see, I will stop my share. So here are the Vermont Suicide Prevention Coalition priorities. And I will tell you that these were in a bill that was being um, discussed last year. And when COVID hit, that was set aside for other COVID related priorities and also because COVID did lend some resources to uh, short term to some of this work in which we've been able to initiate a pilot project where we're, we're building the pathway between the seven designated mental health agencies that are participating in the Zero Suicide Project with 17 corresponding primary care practices through that, that, that funding, which is really very exciting and um, we hope we'll have some really good outcomes for the pathway. So here are the priorities. Uh, the first is to create a full-time position within the Department of Mental Health. There is no designated position within state government to think about and address suicide prevention. As you know, suicide prevention tends to be a nexus for many corresponding mental health issues. Thinking strategically about these and how we move upstream is really going to make a difference. 
Um, this position would oversee suicide prevention strategies throughout the state and maximize the impact of existing programs and coordinate alignment of efforts. The coalition is fully in support of this. Um, the second is to increase outreach of suicide prevention resources by expanding and bringing to scale the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. I think perhaps Allison may have shared with you some very favorable movement in that regard, uh, I hope. Um, the the National, yes. Okay, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline is soon to be 988. And we will be, uh, I know there has been a committee call to look at the best uh, implementation plan for that. We highly recommend an increase in means reduction strategy, particularly addressing the role of access to lethal means and increasing awareness of safe, safe storage and practices for firearms. Expanding programs that provide mental health and suicide prevention along the continuum of care, which I just spoke about, that would be our uh, expanding existing zero suicide initiatives. Targeting at-risk populations with suicide prevention strategies by working with our partners throughout the state who can best reach those populations based on existing health disparities expanding the creation and evaluation of targeted resources for risk set group older um, risk groups, older Vermonters, LGBTQ, uh, youth and young adults, veterans, and our um, people of color. To expand programs that promote connectedness for youth and families, supporting elder care clinician programs that create connections um, for our elders and address social isolation and provide suicide prevention presentations for health and education professionals that address um, populations at risk. There's huge need to expand to uh, families serving uh, foster care to our juvenile justice system and our justice system overall. Um, really, there's huge room for expansion of our prevention programming to promote protective factors for youth and families and to create prevention prepared school communities. Um, there is a recommendation to expand You Matter Suicide Prevention, a national best practice program and in full disclosure developed by the Center for Health and Learning. Um, and other gatekeeper programs that are being uh, used in Vermont. And finally, the one I can speak the least to is request Medicare waiver to improve access to treatment, which Allison may already have spoken of and or our colleagues at um, Vermont Healthcare Access could speak to that. Um, with that presentation, I will uh, wind it up and see if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there particular questions for uh, Joellen at this point in time? Joellen will also turn to you as a continuing resource, both with the uh, Department of Mental Health and others. So let's let's take some questions and let's be mindful of the fact that we have other witnesses as well. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, Joellen, were you? No, okay. Uh, Representative Blackman, Representative Goldman. Um, thank you. I'm sorry. I could you explain the graph that you put up? I don't. Certainly, I didn't, I didn't quite understand what it was trying to say. Absolutely. So let me um, bring it up again, and um, I have to get to my share screen. So hold on, please. And um, I should be able to find it. Here you are. Okay. There you go. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So um, we have been working, uh, Representative Black, with the designated mental health system under the Vermont Care uh, Partners umbrella, uh, really for the past five years. Um, since 2015, when the Zero Suicide Initiative was launched nationally, and we learned about it at a national conference, and our then director of medical um, 
director at Department of Mental Health uh, brought it and determined it should be a priority in Vermont. We had three designated mental health agencies uh, step forward at that time to begin the implementation of uh, the many facets of developing suicide safer pathways to care. This all comes out of data which indicates um, back in 2018 that 80% of the people who had died by suicide nationally in the previous year had seen either a mental health provider, a primary care doctor, or gone to the emergency department within the previous 12 months. So that raises many questions about what is or isn't happening in the pathway to care. Um, those, that data would never be acceptable for other chronic health conditions such as heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. So um, this chart shows that uh, since 2012 to 2020, the number of suicide deaths um, who were served by our DA within the previous year. So those who um, were seen within our designated mental health system, uh, the number of deaths resulting um, or not resulting, I, that is not good language, the number of deaths um, continued to decrease among those who are seeking help in our mental health system. And so this is very favorable for the services of our system, particularly um, since 2015 when there was a major spike and then um, a downward trend since then. So, I mean, I, I see the positive of that. I'm just I'm thinking, knowing that Vermont's um, suicide rate is steadily climbing, doesn't this also show that we're not reaching? So what this shows is that we are we aiming- be reaching? Yeah, we are aiming to ensure that people who need help get into our system of care. This is a huge problem, is that many and most of the people who die are not in a system of care, a pathway of care. And then we want to ensure that once they get into the pathway of care, that the care is effective, that people are trained and prepared to provide care that has good outcomes. And that requires protocols for screening and tools for screening and assessing a person's risk, low, medium, high, and ensuring that if they are, uh, are at risk, screened at risk, then they can get into a pathway for immediate intervention, timely response, and effective treatment. Does that so help? I think what, what this is showing- I, 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 Thank you, I, I do understand that. I, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that I was looking at the right thing. Yeah. Well, you've asked a very good question, and that is, um, what about all the people who are not in the system of care? This graph only speaks to those who were in the system of care. So what we need to do is, uh, you know, buoy up our system of care, uh, which I know you are striving to address through a variety of channels with mental health and uh, primary care as well. You know, a primary care doctor, the research is very clear, will, is very hesitant to identify somebody at risk for mental illness and or suicide if they don't perceive effective treatment or a good pathway to care. And so we need to create the pathway between where they're identified, which might be primary care, it might be emergency department, it might be in the mental health agency, or it might be in an independent provider setting. Wherever they access care, we wanna make sure there are good linkages to the next step of care. And that a good linkage means a warm handoff because when people don't have proper care coordination, uh, then they're again on their own and can um, be at high, very high risk, especially if they've sought care and there's a, a break in care. And second of all, when they are, are moved along a continuum to get care, that the people who are there are trained through effective workforce development and using effective tools to meet their needs. 
just like we would do. So I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I really need to interrupt. We're, 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 I'm, there's fine. so much important information, but we're, we're exceeding the time that we have. And so I Very apologize. I, I apologize. will stop my share. You never need to apologize. I know how much you manage and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. But I, uh, I do stand by to provide any further responses. Right. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm concerned only because in respect for the, our other witnesses, Absolutely. that they get to be heard as well. So Representative Goldman, do you want to name your question and if it can be answered briefly, perhaps, but we really need to keep moving. Candy, um, I'm just wondering <laughs> if you have data or experience whether a 20, a 48 hour uh, waiting period for firearm purchases affects suicide. Yes, I know that Dr. Elliot Nelson and Dr. Paul Mangiello, um, both professors emeritus from UVM Medical Center and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, are better versed in this data and they work closely, uh, Dr. Nelson in particular, with the Harvard um, Means Matter program. Um, I know that within 24 hours that there is um, some need to you know really look into that data and I would defer to them and I'd be happy to uh, put you in touch with them. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, thank you uh, for all your work and there's as with so many topics, there's so much more to know and lots of questions that many of us would like to ask as well. but thank you. Thank you. I will sign off now. Okay, great. Uh, I believe uh, I'm Dan is with us uh, from uh, who who works as a peer support staff member and Dan I'm going to let you introduce yourself I think you've been with us before uh, as I remember and maybe if I'm forgetting that not getting that correct why don't you introduce yourself to the committee oh sure actually I have been with you before but this is my my first official testimony so you'll have to uh, indulge me any missteps and okay. uh, and and. Uh, uh, kudos to you for pronouncing my name spot on. Um, okay. Great. Representative Lippert. I, and what I'd like to thank you all for including me in today's schedule. I am here representing myself, which reflects a number of roles in mental health, which I'll discuss later. The topic of my testimony today is community mental health services and Within that, I'm gonna specifically focus on peer support. Great. In summary, what I wanna to talk to you about is the power of peer. So first, I'm gonna briefly describe peer support, peer support workers and peer support services. I'll give you a summary of my background as it relates to peer support services, touch upon the benefits and finally give you my call to action. So um, as many of you may know, and certainly Anne is well-versed in this um, at the very least, uh, peer support has been described as a system of giving and receiving help based on key principles that include shared responsibility and mutual agreement of what is helpful. Peer specialists use their own personal and lived, ex lived experience recovering from a mental illness to support others in their recovery. This lived experience distinguishes peer support workers from traditional mental health service providers. So what's a peer support worker? Well, peer support providers are people with personal experience with mental health, substance use, or trauma conditions who receive specialized training and supervision to guide and support others who are experiencing similar issues toward increased wellness in the spirit of mutuality and compassion. In general, a peer supporter is an individual who's made a personal commitment to his or her own wellness and recovery and is willing to share that, what he, has, he or she has learned about their own mental health journey in an inspirational way. So what are peer support services? Well, they include a wide variety of activities, including advocacy, connecting individuals in recovery to resources, sharing experiences, community, relationship building, group facilitation, skill building, mentoring, and goal setting. Peer support workers also plan and develop groups, support groups, services and activities. They supervise other peer, peer workers, provide training, gather information on resources, administer program, programs or agencies, 
educate the public and policymakers while all the time working to eliminate stigma and discrimination. So turning to my background to give um, context for the, my discussion here about peer support. First, I was born in Burlington and I was diagnosed with a major mood condition about 25 years ago in the middle of a career in corporate finance in Connecticut. I am also a survivor of multiple inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations. So for the first 20 years of my mental health journey, uh, my mo mo modalities of therapy were med medication and talk therapy, which provided some level of stability, but my condition really deteriorated. So five years ago, essentially I was forced into retirement um, and moved to Vermont. Soon after moving to Vermont, I discovered a peer support group run by Nanny Vermont, and that changed my life. My, 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 recover, my recovery improved steadily and my mental health stability has been the best it's been in many years. My sustained recovery has enabled me not only to become a peer support worker and volunteer, but also a mental health and peer support adv advocate and organizer. So I work as an operator answering calls for Pathways Support Line, the warm line, as I like to call it. Um, and I volunteer as a support group facilitator and trainer for NAMI Vermont. In my advocacy work, I represent the voice of Vermonters who have lived mental health experience, specifically on, on DMH's adult program standing committee and the federal SAMHSA Block Grant Planning Council. Organizationally, I am vice chair of the Peer Workforce Development Initiative, which among other tasks is creating and delivering training to peer, so peer support workers across the state and developing a peer specialist certification program. So that's, uh, that's peer support. That's my background in a nutshell. So, so what are the benefits? Peer support has been well-researched and documented as a highly cost-effective evidence-based practice, practice with a myriad of benefits. Just to cite a few examples, in a 2003 study of patients diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression, some were treated with peer support services and others without. The patients who had peer support had better out health outcomes and at a lower cost. Moreover, those receiving peer support services experienced significant reduction in drug alcohol use, improved mental and physical health, and increased social support for people experiencing homelessness. Further in 2003, the president's New Freedom Commission on Mental Health identified peer support as the vehicle for psychiatric survivor peers to share their knowledge, skills, and experience of recovery. In 2007, excuse me, the Center for Medicaid and, and Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services deemed peer support, quote, an evidence-based mental health model of care, end quote, and issued guidelines to states for how to pay for peer services using Medicaid. Meanwhile, other research has demonstrated peer support is associated with significantly fewer inpatient and emergency service hours and significant improvements in healing, empowerment, and satisfaction. So that leads to my uh, final set of points, which is my call to action. First, I'm urging you to make peer support an integral part of the mental health and substance use service delivery here in Vermont. Uh, in many ways, uh, peer support is a, is a part of service delivery across the state within the DAs. Um, of course, entities like My Employer Pathways Vermont and Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, um, Alyssum are, are run and or staffed by peers. So we have a, we have a lot of experience in the state. Um, however, we could do more. People with extensive experience in peer support should be involved in at multiple levels of of planning and implementation of peer support services 
within the Agency of Health Services and DMH, the designated agencies, and other major health organizations. Next, state statutes governing the practice of mental health professions should be amended to remove barriers that artificially restrict the scope of activities of peer support workers. Further, Vermont should set aside an appropriate percentage of state funds that are specifically earmarked for peer support programs beyond what we have right now. Family and, family and adolescent peer support service should also be further developed and, and should complement uh, the adult services. Moreover, we should assure that trained peer advocates are included among the groups of people permitted to provide crisis support in emergency preparedness and, re and response plans. Specifically, as we are now looking at the intersection of law enforcement and mental health, we should be looking to the optimal ways to use peer support workers in crisis situations to help establish, establish connections, de-escalate, prevent violence while diverting those afflicted from emergency rooms and from traumatizing locked inpatient psychiatric facilities. In addition to help foster the growth of peer support services, including at, a, at small nimble non-for-profits in the state, statutes should seek to minimize the reporting burden while maintaining accountability in order to facilitate service provision and entry of peers into the services environment. I would also urge you to continue to support the peer workforce development an issue, which I mentioned earlier, in developing the peer specialist certification. Certification and advanced certification play a critical role in promoting professionalism and, and, and in obtaining reimbursement for services, but Opportunities for peers without certification should also be available as well. And lastly, I suggest that the peer workforce development initiative be funded further to support research on the e efficacy of peer support programs and the different structural and training considerations that promote that greater, that greater efficiency and effectiveness. So in conclusion, I urge you to recognize, support, and fund the power of peer. Thank you. I open it up to any questions you may have. Right. Can I start by saying I appreciate how powerfully and clearly you have articulated both the uh, power of peer advocacy and your call to action. Thank you. Thank and I will you. Open it up to other questions of committee members have questions at this time. I would also say that uh, we, I would be pleased uh, on behalf of the committee to have you join with us uh, at a later time as we review advocacy positions that this committee may move forward uh, through either the budgeting process uh, or the uh, general statutory, uh, statutory proposals, a number of which you've touched on. Right, no, I'd be happy to. Well, I, I don't see any questions, right? Well, I do see a question from Representative Houghton. Apologies. Thank you, Representative Houghton, for waving your hand because your little yellow hand got lost in the corner there. And no I, worries. Um, I'm going to pause video just for a moment. Do not take this as a lack of interest. Uh, I live in a passive solar house and I'm now roasting. Now, now that the sun has finally come out, so I'm going to go open a window. I can't. Excuse me. Dan, thank you for that powerful testimony. I'm just wondering if that um, can be submitted to our committee assistant so we can have it on record to ensure that we, for the call to action, is um, is with us. Would that be oh, possible? Sure. That would sure. be great. I'll, I'll I'll have to clean up my notes a little bit, but um, abso absolutely. That would, you know, even if it's just the, I mean, everything was wonderful, but even if it's just a call to action, that would be really helpful to have yeah, with us. Sure enough. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, Representative Houghton, thank you for asking for that, because it'd be helpful to have a, a, the clear articulation of the different points that you made for us to consider, which I think, speaking for myself, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there may be a great deal of interest. 
So thank you. Um, so I'm going to, so it's now 2.39. We have, um, we have Laurie Emerson from NAMI Vermont, and then we have the executive director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, who I think has also invited uh, someone to testify with him, two, two of them, two people. And, you know, they were initially scheduled for 3.30 and we said, oh no, we'll probably get there sooner. So, and then, you know, of course, then we mistakenly moved it up. Uh, but uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to suggest that we hear from NAMI Vermont and then with the goal, uh, Laurie, uh, with the goal that we are turning to Vermont Psychiatric Survivors uh, by three o'clock so that we can at least hear first from uh, the representatives that are going to testify in addition to their executive director who I wanna respect the fact that they made themselves available to our committee uh, this afternoon. So Laurie, let's turn to you for uh, uh, NAMI Vermont. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, for the record, my name is Lori Emerson. I'm the executive director at NAMI Vermont, and that is the independent uh, Vermont chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And as our, our cornerstone for NAMI Vermont, we focus on support, education, and advocacy. And we're a nonprofit 501c3 organization. And all of our volunteers um, administer our free programs that we have for the community, uh, for providers, um, and, and we also do many different presentations as well. So I wanna thank you for allowing NAMI Vermont to provide testimony to your committee for Mental Health Advocacy Day or week. Uh, my comments will focus on two areas, um, mental health crisis response, and telehealth testimony in a psychiatric facility from a community member. So this year's Mental Health Advocacy Day was held virtually this year and we had 250 advocates and organizations there on February 1st. And thanks so much for those who could attend. If you couldn't attend, we have a link, uh, we have a recording of the event and um, I would encourage all of you to take a look at that. We have a lot of, sharing stories towards the end of our, our day, which I think you'll find of great interest. When a mental health crisis happens, it should get a mental health response. The handcuffing and pepper spraying of a nine-year-old girl in Rochester, New York, last Friday by local law enforcement after a crisis deserved help, not handcuffs and pepper spray. NAMI believes that responses to situations like this family's crisis should be met with well-trained mobile crisis that provide the de-escalation, help, and support that people need. And these teams should include peer and family support advocates. A police response to a mental health crisis is not the answer. Police are trained to respond to criminal encounters. We've seen countless times when police respond to a mental health crisis and it can escalate a situation and the likelihood of criminal charges being filed, or worse yet, someone is injured or killed. We need to avoid these encounters by having alternatives to responding to mental health crises. Many families or community members do not know or understand what options and alternatives exist for their community other than calling 911 or bringing their loved one to the emergency room, which could be, which should be, a last resort and only if someone is in immediate danger to self or others. Last year, federal adoption of 988 as a three digit number for mental health, substance use and suicidal crises, which will be affected nationwide by July, 2022, provides a path forward to accelerate better options for communities across the country. NAMI Vermont advocates for state and local crisis systems that combine well-trained call centers with mobile crisis teams that includes peer support to meet people where they are at and crisis stabilization programs. Other states are creating legislation that will ensure a well-funded system is in place once the 988 phone number is active. Vermont needs to ensure the 988 number and system is comprehensive and addresses three things, mental health, substance use and suicidal crises, and not to serve as only a suicide prevention lifeline. We can set up call centers and crisis teams, but what next? 
where do we, where do people go to get immediate help? Do we continue to keep bringing people to the emergency room? No. We need to invest into crisis stabilization programs, a program that allows drop-ins, that allows people to stabilize within 24 hours in a home-like setting and then are referred back to the community and followed up on. Another example of a crisis response model is from Eugene, Oregon, the CAHOOTS program. They've been in existence for about 31 years and they're a non-police trauma-informed mobile response to children and adults in crisis. Last year, out of a total of about 24,000 CAHOOTS calls, police backup was only requested 150 times. As Vermont builds crisis response system that includes mobile mental health crisis clinicians, it is critical that we also include people living in long-term recovery from mental illness to be part of the design, the planning, and the workforce. Some people respond better to peer approach. And every community and individual has unique challenges and needs. And each of those responses needs to be tailored to fit that local environment and that person. So additionally, NAMI Vermont and Team 2 Vermont are, are scheduling screenings of the Ernie and Joe Crisis Cop documentary. And it includes an interactive panel discussion with different communities throughout Vermont. And I would highly encourage um, this committee to, to join in when we have our next documentary screening. And I'll just share that information with you when that's available. What it, the documentary follows is two San Antonio police officers from the mental health unit and how they approach crisis intervention by de-escalation and diverting people from the criminal justice system. So I hope you can be involved in that conversation with local communities. So we request that the state and your committee continue to establish alternatives to mental health crisis intervention and crisis stabilization, which will help diversion from the criminal justice system. So thanks so much for listening to those comments from NAMI Vermont. I do want to include a, a testimony about telehealth from a patient who was involved in our legislative training and she specifically addressed this one topic and I, I thought it was important to include that for your committee to listen to. Can you articulate what her testimony is or is that? Yes, absolutely. It's about telehealth in a, yeah. a psychiatric uh, facility. And I, I know you're working on a telehealth bill. So yeah. I thought this would be very pertinent to, to what you're working on. Um, so she's a resident from Middlebury and her ask is for support to have on-site inpatient psychiatrists instead of video psychiatric care at inpatient facilities as a normal standard of care. So one of the most difficult issues for her was with psychiatric care during an inpatient stay at Brattleboro Retreat in 2019. So this was even before the pandemic. When she met with her psychiatrist, she was, she was surprised when she was put in front of a video screen. Having been out of the retreat for a couple years, she was shocked at the changes when she came back with video telehealth being the biggest change. And when she asked further about this practice, she was told that most psychiatrists at the retreat are no longer physically present and only see patients via video. A rotating practitioner would be there as well, but the video practitioner was a normal standard of care in the inpatient facility at the retreat. She was suffering with depression, desperate for help, needing human interaction and assistance, and questioning her own worth. To treat anyone who was in a critical psychiatric situation with a video screen felt very cold and uncaring. To her, it felt as if the hospital didn't find her worthy to have an in-person dialogue. Human interaction is critical, and in particular during a crisis. Being alone with a video screen and no physical presence felt inappropriate, unsupportive, and cold. She eventually found a different facility in Vermont where this practice did not happen, and the feeling of care and compassion was conveyed through direct interaction. By not having that physical presence, it makes people feel alone and unwanted and impacts the crisis even further. Instead of meeting the patient in a manner which is uninhibited, the limited visibility and communication through the screen is one more obstacle in the way of psychological progression and recovery. 
Inpatient facilities require hands-on interaction. We are all human and the more impersonal you make it, the harder it can be for someone to actually feel like they are being listened to or cared for appropriately. We need to get psychiatrists back into inpatient facilities with real interactions. There's no substitute for in-person care and it will, be led, it will lead to better outcomes. She would ask that all inpatient facilities in the state of Vermont require as a standard of care in-person visits with their primary inpatient psychiatric practitioner at a minimum five days per week. This would mean inpatient facilities would not be allowed to have video sessions more than two days per week with patients pertaining to the subject of inpatient psychiatric care. Additionally, NAMI Vermont has heard from other members who are in the emergency room being evaluated via video through a phone camera to be assessed for voluntary admission to a psychiatric hospital. And this was also pre-COVID time. And they found the experience impersonal, uncaring, and dehumanizing. However, when we hear from members who have anxiety or live in rural areas without transportation or the internet, a phone appointment is very beneficial for them to be involved with outpatient care, such as counseling appointments or primary care visits. So that was the testimony as written uh, by somebody who, who was involved in our training. And I just wanted to share that with you. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you. We will take that into consideration as we move forward both on. Sure our work around mental health in general and telehealth. Thank you. Are there uh, particular questions for NAMI Vermont, for Lori and NAMI Vermont? Not seeing any at the moment. I wanna thank you. Thank, thank you for you. joining us, making yourself available and sharing your valuable insights to our committee. Great, thank you very much. I believe we actually are now uh, prepared to welcome uh, Karim Chapman. And I'm not, Karim, I, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your name properly. I don't think we've met previously. Uh, welcome. Uh, but I think I, I see that you're with us on the screen. I saw that you had joined us uh, just a minute or two ago. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Okay. You were close. You were close. It's Kareem. 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 Okay. The so Kareem. That's what I was starting with. But I. Um... Yes. You were close. So <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, you guys actually had a time, which is awesome. Um, I did have uh, two people who were going to be testifying with me. They were scheduled at three o'clock. Yeah. So I believe how it was, was going to work that you will, you guys will call in. But I guess I can start. You know, we. A little oh, we do, time let me this. let me let me ask you this, Kareem. Yeah. Uh, is it, it, would it be valuable for you to be able to be telling us about your work with Vermont Psychiatric Survivors with the other friends, colleagues on the Zoom screen while you're doing that? Or can we go forward hearing from you and then have them join us when they're available? What, what makes best sense well, from your end? Well, I am okay with either way, but I did see a comment that you guys, somebody asking for a five minute break. So. <laughs> I, I what you know, I guess you guys been here for a while, so I'm okay with the five minute break. Um, that'll that'll give you guys some time and I can just get started and the other folks will be on with me. That's okay. okay. I think I think that's a plan. I think we've made a plan here. <laughs> it's coll it's right. Collaboration. I love it. There you go. There you okay. go. Okay, great. Right. So five, five. Minute, five minute break. Uh let's let's come back on just before three. And again, a reminder. If you need any reminders, check the news but a reminder to go off video and off screen, please, not for the same reasons, but anyway, go off video, off screen, so that we're clear that we're not online right now. Yep. Okay, and just to explain, uh, Kareem, we have several members whose, video, whose uh, internet connection is very shaky today, so they're, they're not going to be on screen. Uh, okay. I thought, um, so, and are your folks ready? Are they going? They're going to call in. Is that my understanding? Yeah, there was uh, there was some connection errors happening, but I think um, Colleen is handling it right now. Okay, Colleen's working. Um, on it. Okay. Yeah. So I could begin whenever you're ready, and hopefully, you know, towards the end of my presentation, they will be on board and 
right. I can pass it to them. Well, let me let me start by saying welcome. And I'm also, um, because I think this is the first time you've appeared with our committee since you've taken on your new role. Correct. Excuse me. Um, perhaps let's do, let's do a round of introductions. I think that might be uh, appropriate awesome. respect for, for us as committee members. Uh, I'm going to start with myself, Bill Lippert. I represent the town of Heinsberg and I chair the committee. And you, in fact, of course, know our vice chair, uh, Representative Donahue. Uh, sorry, Anna, kind of not this <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to just pass it around the screen. I, uh, Representative Black, would you introduce yourself and, and then pass it to another member and not just the new members? Hi, Kareem. I'm Alyssa Black. I represent Essex and Westford. Um, and I will pass it to Representative Cordes. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Kareem. It's nice to have you here. My name is Mari Cordes and I live in Lincoln, representing Bristol, Lincoln, Moncton, and Starksboro. And I'll pass it on to Representative Pete. Nice to meet you. I'm not sure where you passed it, Mari. I didn't catch it. Uh, Representative Page. Page. Okay. Representative Page may be having internet connections. Uh, I'll his go with Representative Chena. Okay. Hi, Cream. My name is Brian Chena, and I represent a piece of Burlington because Burlington has 12 representatives. And the piece of Burlington I represent is Chittenden 6 4, which is most of the East District and part of the old North End of Burlington, which is where I actually live. So, welcome to our Thank committee. You. It's great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Representative Peterson, would you like to go next? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Art Peterson, I represent Rutland District 2, towns of Clarendon, Wallingford, West Rutland, Tinmouth, and Proctor. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm going to keep just patting. Representative Goldman. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure. Welcome to our committee. Um, I represent Wyndham 3, which is in northeastern Wyndham County, Athens, Brookline, Grafton, Rockingham, part of Westminster, and Wyndham. Nice to meet you. And Representative Burroughs is off video because she has a shaky internet connection. Are you there, Elizabeth? Would you here. like to say I'm hello? Here. I'm here. Hold on. Let me see if I can get it to... <laughs> Sorry. Hello. There you go. Hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm Elizabeth Burroughs. I represent, I live in West Windsor. I represent Windsor One, which is uh, Heartland, West Windsor, and Windsor. Nice to meet you. Okay. Nice to meet you. And I think that takes us to Representative Page. And if you can hear me, Woody, I'm happy to have you introduce yourself. Otherwise, I'll introduce Representative Page, who is uh, from the Northeast Kingdom part of Vermont and Newport, I believe, uh, representing Newport. So uh, why, So we have a number of other folks on the line with us, and I see there's someone possibly on the phone line. Uh, but I think we could begin, Kareem, and we'll have you, and someone else is about to join us by phone, I believe. So we'll have you begin, and then have you manage uh, introducing others who are with you. The time is yours. Awesome. Well, let me first just start by saying thank you um, for the time to uh, testify and to kind of tell you a little bit about VPS and, and what we're doing. Um, and I don't also want to say I am a survivor myself. I've, I've been through um, psychiatric facilities as a young man. I saw my father killed um, by police that really sent me to, to a very traumatic um, time as a young man. And, and it, it put me in a role where I made a lot of bad choices and it wasn't until I ran into a peer support person in my life that really helped me to get into a better place. So I'll, I'll just start with that short, brief mm -hmm. background. So yes, I am the new executive director for Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, VPS has been around for about 38 years. Um, and our mission is to provide advocacy and mutual support that seeks to end psychiatric coercion, oppression, and discrimination. So what that simply means is that at a time where in the 70s, really, when people um, in agencies and systems kind of looked at people with mental health issues as some, some kind of disease or 
uh, uh, people who are just crazy, um, a group of folks got together and said, you know what, we need a place for people who are survivors, for people who are going through uh, some mental health challenges and need support. So this organization was developed. And I can say till this day, we are still supporting and providing support for all survivors throughout the state of Vermont. Uh, we currently are operating within 10 hospitals. And as we all know, the pandemic has not uh, been making that easy. Um, but we are uh, virtually um, in most hospitals. It's been a little bit of a uh, uh, back and forth, but some progress is happening there. Um, so what I want to get into right now is just saying and getting into some points of issues that I think um, VPS uh, stands by and, and speaking on behalf of um, survivors in the state, if that's okay. Um, towards the end of my presentation, is, and I, I don't want to talk a long time. I want to save a lot of time for the two folks who agreed to be brave and speak and mm -hmm. give their truths. I don't want to talk a lot, but I do want to kind of hit some points and pass it on to uh, Annette and Greg. So, issues of concern. Peer services expansion is one of the major parts of the 10-year vision, but there are no expansions of services proposed at DMH. By peer services provides do not have a voice at DMH. And I'll just stop right there. I think it's very important that the peer world, definitely VPS, that we have a voice. I think a lot of years have gone by where we have not had a voice. And we think if we had a voice, a part of DMH, it would be very helpful with transparency and is having better guidance and support where we need it, okay? Uh, VPS is supposed to be providing patient representation for all involuntary patients in 10 locations around the state. Now, hospital oversight. We know that DMH has a lot of oversight, but we think that it could use more support around that. Um, if we were to have more support specifically with DMH um, as oversight and involve peer organizations, that would be so helpful so impactful and sky's the limit of how much work could get done if we had that oversight and support from DMH. Not saying that there aren't people there who are not supporting us like Trish um, and, and Morning Fox who are always there by phone call or email, they are always there to support us. But we do, we do want more of oversight and a voice uh, within that system to give better support to the peer organizations. Um, okay. DMH does not monitor hospitals regarding voluntary psych care. Seclusions and resident and restraints happens to voluntary patients, but is not reviewed. Overall use of seclusion and restraint in Vermont hospitals is growing instead of declining. We're seeing more of that declining than going down. And we look at that as an issue. Once again, just putting it back on the peer support and what the impact that we have in working with patients while they're in and when they're coming out of these facilities. Again, the, the collaboration, the connections that we need from not only this body, but also DMH to be a really good role and, and play a really good part in connecting and supporting us, okay? Community needs are being ignored in favor of institutions. DMH's own report shows that people are stuck in hospitals because of lack of housing. Some are discharged to homelessness. Now, we think that that is an issue. There is no reason why we have someone in care and can't have a healthy transition when they're leaving and going into a home or some kind of support. Having someone leave a facility and be homeless is just not right. And if anybody thought about well, our own family in that situation, how would you feel if your family were just kicked out and put on the street? So we really hope that people take a look at that and really understand the support that we need to make sure that this, that's being done differently, okay? Hospital Medicaid, Medicaid reimbursements should not come from DMH budgets because they seek money, I'm sorry, they suck money out of the budget for community services and is not partially, I'm sorry, um, partially with other hospitals' budgets. There's so much money going around that most organizations are fighting for it. Why does it always have to be a fight to do the right thing? Why does it always have to be so much controversy around supporting and helping people 
when they're out when they, in our care. So again, I think we could do a lot better. I think this body has, has not only the authority, um, but I think the potential to really step in and play a role in supporting us around us. And I'll just say one last thing, and I, I really want to move on and let the other people talk, or I don't want to talk too much, but um, Bill H-46 and the committee addresses some important issues. We support it. One, it addresses some of the gaps in site survivor voices, requires a law for site survivors to be a majority on a DA hospital and state um, adversary committees. Requires all designated hospitals to have then right now only level one are required. The restraint and seclusion oversight committees should also be site survivors and advocates. Currently there is only one site survivor position. The rest are mostly the hospital providers. Once again, that goes, that speaks really to the peer voice not being involved and at the table of these conversations and policy decisions. So once again, we need to be a part of it. We want to be a part of it. Um, and we are here doing the work. Even during these dark times, we're out here doing the work and we really need support from this body and everybody who has the, who has the authority and some kind of powerful pen to make some powerful things happen for people with care, okay? Again, I'm a survivor. I've been through it. I've been medicated. I've been told that I'm gonna be on medication for the rest of my life. And today I can report, I'm not on medication. I'm holding a job. I'm, I, am, I am progressing in life. And I'm a person who was in a facility and was told that I will never get better. So again, let's take a look at how we can do a better job in supporting not only the hospitals, but organizations that are very small in trying to do this big work. Okay, so I think you guys have, have the power and authority and, and the means to do it. So, so please, I, I wish to be supported and for all of us to be supported around these efforts. So with that, I'm gonna be quiet <laughs> and I'm gonna, allow, I'm gonna introduce um, two very powerful individuals, two also survivors, people who are conducting their own work in the community with their support groups throughout Vermont. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Annette and Greg and I'm gonna let them, Annette, I don't know if you wanna go first if you're there, Annette. I think I see her number. Annette, are you there? You may be muted. Uh, yeah, in order to unmute mute. from the telephone, you need to press star six. So if you heard that, Annette, you got to press star six. There you go. Yep. You there? OK, this, this is Annette Denio. And Greg and I have conferred about this, and unfortunately, he has an appointment at the cancer center getting results today. Pray God. But so I'm going to speak for both of us for our groups through United Council, and we facilitate through the CRT program, the Crisis and Rehabilitation Treatment Program, and we both are were introduced into this mental illness psychiatric world by traumatic brain injuries. Greg ended up in a coma for several days, come out and his life was not the same. I had a parasitic brain infection come out of stuff and my life was not the same. We both had careers, everything going for us and we had to change. We both were hospitalized and we have been met many times in institutions United Council is helpful, but we have to both say the peer programs, not the therapy or the medication, have helped us as much as these peer programs have a hundredfold. We haven't been in the hospital in years. We now facilitate peer, peer programs, and we've done that for years because there's nobody that understands more than ones that have been there. And we, I always say there's, we all have the same boat, but many different oars. There's many avenues that we have had to travel, no matter what it is. And we are thriving on this. The COVID hit us hard. Um, we had to switch our group. We ended up doing a phone service just like this through a community care home where there's 16 clients. And most of them have attended our groups. Greg does a teaching group. 
and he's added an activity on the end, and we have an incentive prize for whoever comes. I do a social group. I used to do it on Fridays, a social club, complete games, socializing, getting people that speak that never spoke, people that smiled, people that talked, people that learned the difference between a good pick and a bad pick because they had no idea because mental illness, society just crushes on it. And we get it. We've been there. We're peers. Our groups together, I ran an average of 25 people in my club, enough where we had to stop because we were over fire capacity for the room. Greg's group ran anywhere from 10 to 15. Now that we're in the community care home, we've involved the whole house because there's 16 there and there's four others that aren't per se, mental illness, but they need to support. And we get a lot of thank yous, a lot of I love yous, a lot of you haven't left us. And we're still there. We're still doing it. We love them. We are peers. And I am so into this peer support. I was a charge nurse for years in geriatrics, a whole other realm, but, you know, a lot of the same. Uh Uh-oh, sorry. A lot of the same issues. But we are, I'm sorry, my dogs. We're, we're, we've, we're, become we're quite, just we've become this. quite used to dogs, no problem. All right, they're two little ones. Um, Greg, I have them on the phone now. I'll let you go right after me. But we're, we're so, used, so dedicated to this that we want to keep fighting. But we need the funding. We do need the funding because we found with our groups, this indeed, they tell us, it has kept people out of the hospital. We have precautions with one of the groups. I did a depression and bipolar. We rated people, are you a one to a nine? If they were lower than a three, they got therapy. We used to call United Council and they'd come evaluate them. But the admissions have gone way down just because we stand together and we call and there's a friendship in the building. There's a friendship outside of the building. We even get together for barbecues. And... um, it's just a wonderful thing, and we are very grateful. But, you know, we do need support. It's nice to have monies for supplies, for teachings. Um, even for Greg, when he does an extended lesson on his group, which is Hot Topics. And you know what? You need a little bit to support for that, for all the supplies. Um, but I'm grateful for do this and doing this, and I continue to do this because this keeps me out of the hospital. I get just as much from it as Greg does. And I'm going to hand the phone over to Greg. Thank, thank you, Annette. Annette, uh, when, will you stay on the line then so we can talk, ask questions to both of you? Yeah, we have the same phone. Yeah, that's we're an, both yeah, the That's my understanding, yeah. So let's hear from Greg, and then maybe we'll have, if there are questions, we can address them to either or both of you. Hi, uh, my name is Greg Berter, and um, what uh, what would you guys like to know, or what's the uh, well, there a question? Yeah, let me ask. I'll ask you a couple questions, Greg. That uh, so, first of all, welcome. I'm glad you're willing to be with us. Uh, your colleague and friend Annette was telling us that she had, in fact, uh, she was herself a survivor, and told us just a short version of her journey in, in hospitalization and now work being supported through peer support. And she, she said that you had some of the same experience or similar experience, and it would be helpful to uh, hear. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I, um, I myself am a survivor. I, uh, um, I, it, it's, uh, my mental health issues came about because of a traumatic brain injury. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent a lot of time in the hospital, uh, probably uh, probably a good uh, five years total out of the 13, about 13 that it took me to uh, finally get back to be able to live in, um, you know, a, a regular life and a safe life. And as far as uh, the... Uh, the um, the peer support goes. Uh, it's peer support has to be like a number one thing. If you have, if you have somebody that has mental health issues, um, 
it, it makes it a lot easier to understand um, because, uh, you know, of having the same uh, experiences. Um, and uh, like Annette was saying, um, you know, we're... Uh, you know we're committed to this. You know our people that um, you know they you know they count on us. You know they're cooped. You know I mean it's I wouldn't want to be in that position that they're in. And we never stop doing our group. I mean we you know well once the COVID hit, it's like okay so you know what's our way around it? You know and and um, you know we, we ended up coming up with a plan and we implemented the plan and we've been rolling right along. Actually. My group has has um, gotten probably uh, a third more uh, members than I had previously when I was just doing it over at CRT. Um, and uh, one of the things is, is you know, I mean, in the beginning, I started this group out of my with my out of my own pocket, and I would continue to run it out of my own pocket. The only problem is, is I can't put a group on like I would like to. Without the support of, uh, you know, the uh, pop grant and that kind of thing, um, you know, I just it, it, I can't do a, a righteous group that I would like to do that. You know, um, especially now I was putting in uh, extra stuff for the guys, you know, for the people, the members to read, you know, when they were, you know, stuck in a situation in the house, um, you know, they had something to turn to. You know, and that's, you know, I'm lucky that I'm able to take, you know, some complicated, you know, medical jogging and stuff like that and turn it into something that people can understand, you know, and they don't have, a, you know, any, any kind of thing like that. You know, and we have a great group, even though we're not together. I mean, um, you know, uh, everybody looks forward to it. Um, you know, people are coming out of the woodwork that we never even knew before. You know, I mean, they were like, you know, standing in the shadows and, you know, now they're like right up front, uh, you know, in the bright light, you know, wanting to, you know, wanting to do more and wanting to know more, you know. So Greg, and Greg, that, can, I, can I interrupt you and ask you, uh, I think Representative Donahue has a question. Perhaps you know her. I don't know if you and Greg know each other. Yeah, Ann. But Ann, yeah. Ann Donahue is uh, the vice chair of our committee. And I'm okay. sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but it's hard when we're on the phone to know when to jump in. But I'm going to let yeah. Ann speak for a minute, and then uh, and then I have another question if you have a minute more. Yeah. So, okay, Greg, yeah. yeah, Greg, before you got on the line, Kareem was talking about how VPS also is active with advocacy, and I, I was just wondering if you could very briefly tell the committee uh, about your work with the hospital, um, the uh, when they opened uh, uh, emergency room space um, for folks. You mean the the psycho hell incident? Yes, that would be the one. <laughs> All right. Well, what uh, my advocacy work, you know, I mean, I've been doing it for uh, you know quite a long time, um, but uh, one of the highlights was uh, um, I they they built some rooms over here at uh, the Bennington Southwest Vermont Medical Center for. Um, people that were waiting to go to Brattleboro or to another facility um, that had mental health issues that were having a crisis or whatever. And uh, um, I only heard about it, and uh, I happened to uh, need to go to uh, Brattleboro. Um, I was having a crisis, and I went there, and they uh, said, you know, well, you'll be able to go into the new rooms that they built and everything. Well, you know, I was all excited about that, and I said, you know, this is great that they finally, you know, completed it and everything. When I went in there, it was it, it was so bad. It was like a sterile prison. Um, I, it, it actually made me worse, and it was luckily that I knew the crisis uh, team worker that came, and, you know, he was able to, you know, say that I wasn't a, a threat to anybody or myself. And you know, I was able to leave because I couldn't stay there. It was it was just horrible. So the next day, I that night I had done some research and I found how Brattleboro had uh, won an award for you know what they had done and you know decorating for uh, the the patients, you know, making it more homey and stuff like that. And I took some of that uh, information and you know my own experience. I went to see uh, 
Miriam Cushing, who's the uh, uh, patient advocate here at uh, SCMC. And, you know, I explained the whole situation to her. Um, well, you know, time went by, and, you know, I wasn't getting anywhere with anybody about, you know, trying to, uh, you know, do something um, in, in the lines of making, you know, the uh, the, the place a, a little bit more homey and, you know, not so not so stuck and sterile and, you know, even more anxious, anxiety growing. So I had uh, written a, a letter about it called uh, Psycho Hell Hidden Away at, at Southwest of Vermont Medical Center, and I sent it to Wilder when she first started, and um, that sparked a, a little bit of a investigation from DMH, and uh, they had found out that some things weren't what they were supposed to be or what they were told. Um, and uh, um, they, they took my advice, and they had, uh, um, you know, done the whole place up really nice, and they, we, they, we, we got invited to see it and to make sure that it was, you know, up to standards that, that you know, if there was anybody that had any other, you know, uh, um, you know, ideas on any other way to make it, you know, more inviting to stay there instead of, you know, like laying in the corner and biting your nails or whatever. Um, and thank, thank uh, you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. You're for, welcome. Thank you for your advocacy. So can I ask Greg and Annette, I want to ask, are you volunteers at this point or are you compensated? Are you paid for your work leading these groups at United Counseling Service? Well, we were paid through a POP grant, but the last time we were paid was last May. So we're doing stuff out of our pocket. We have to. We can't tell people no. Because, again, we've been in the hospital, and Greg and I both had. You get out of discharge of the hospital, there was nothing there. I went through it for 10 years. There was nothing there which would cause me to break down back in the hospital, get out, left to stand alone, break yeah, down. Absolutely. And that's one reason we're such advocates for these peer groups. People get out of the hospital. They need to know what they can cleave to. And right. it causes uh, Annette, them to have, Annette yeah. can you just clarify to answer the, in, in the question, when you were being paid, it was a stipend. You, you weren't on a salary. Is that right? Oh, we were on the POP grant stipend for what we did. <clears throat> well, we still okay. do. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate Yeah, I appreciate that you're continuing to volunteer, but one of the goals, uh, I think we heard from someone earlier with part of their call to action was more funding for peer support work, such as what you're doing. And that's part of what I want to make sure we understand in our committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, you know, allowing us to have this time to, you know, speak up about this. And, you know, it's, it, it's hot. It's really, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to put across in words, you know, uh, uh, you know, how much this means to us and how much this means to the people that we, you know, that we're helping, you know? Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, how I can say it's only like one of the things that I, that I, that one of the sayings that I like is uh, spiritual knowing will never have a written understanding, and that's kind of like what this is. Yeah. You know, you know it deep down inside that you're doing the right thing, and, you know, just a little bit of help from here or there is, you know, makes a whole world of a difference. Yes. yes. Now, can, I tell, can I tell you that you've both been very powerful and effective with your words in communicating with us? So uh, this, I, I, want, I want you to know that you, you have come across in a very positive and important way. Thank you for Thank including you so us. Much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to turn back to Kareem. Uh, and Kareem, I don't know, you have, maybe you have a question for the folks that are on the line yourself, or I'm going to turn it back to you for some comments. And then uh, at some point, we'll, uh, we'll bring this to a close for today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Annette and Greg, you guys rock. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, you, 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 you got it. So I just want to, if, if possible, to share my screen one quick for maybe less than a minute. If that's sure. okay. Absolutely. I think Colleen, our assistant can help you with the screen share. Okay. I think you're a co-host now from what I see. Okay. Let's go. I'm good. Mm. 
Okay, you guys can see my screen? I can see the screen. I uh, don't see, yeah, there we go. Okay, so I, just got, I wanted you guys to take a look at this. You know, th this is really what we support um, and what we stand by. Wait, let me just make sure you guys can see it. So I'll give you a, a second, maybe a minute to read it. So what I'm taking from that, Kareem, is that uh, this is part of the Vision 2030 plan. Correct. Correct. But it's, and, um, but it's more yeah. aspirational than real right now. <laughs> I hear you. Is that a nice but way did, to put it? <laughs> so did everybody get a chance to see it? I'm, I'm going to take it down. Mm -hmm. I think most people have, yeah. Wait, right. wait, wait. Oh, 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 sorry. It's OK. <laughs> Go ahead. I was too slow. It's okay. And we can send a cut. We can send yep. a copy. Yeah, I can send it. So with that, thank you for letting me share. So again, I mean, you heard from, from uh, I'm sure, some very powerful people today. Um, and again, we would love support from this body. You know, um, we can't stress enough the importance of getting it right. You know, there are people suffering um, and people need to know that they have people in their corners and their backs, not just us, you, right? So you, you guys are representatives and I'm sure your constituents are, are definitely looking for you guys to get it right <clears throat> as well. So um, with that, if there's any questions for me, I'd love to answer it. And you know, that, that concludes um, what I needed to say for the presentation. Great, thank you, Kareem. I'm gonna open it to any committee members to ask Kareem particular questions. Uh, I see several right now. I'm going to go to Art, Rep Representative Peterson and then Representative China. Yes, thank yes. you. Uh, Kareem, how many, I have a couple questions and you okay. might have mentioned it and I didn't catch it, but how many people a year do you serve, do you think? I, or maybe you know exactly. So obviously many, because, okay. How many people do you serve in a year, do you think? So because of the pandemic, obviously all numbers are down. We, we, all, we all are aware of that. But anywhere between 50 to 100 plus people that we serve. And remember, the reason why we're servicing that amount of people is because we work through the hospitals. You know, if we had more funding to expand the program to be in the community where we really want to be, remember, we, we only have a contract uh, through DMH to do patient representation, right? So that, that allows us only to really be in the hospitals. So all the extra work that we want to do or we kind of stretch out is very spread thin because we don't have the extra funding to do the extra stuff. You understand? Well, I, so Okay, that was my yeah. other question. Where do you yeah. get, who does fund you? I mean, where do you get DMH. Funding? So our, our, our okay. source of funding is DMH. And to be quite honest with you, like I mentioned before, it's very hard to seek extra support and help. I have literally under 10 staff covering the entire state. Okay. And we're doing it, but it's not easy. You okay. understand? So yeah. the, 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 the demand for funding is, is, is needed. I, I can't stress it enough. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Representative China. Yeah, I, 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 um, I don't have a question, but I wanted to just say something to our guests to just acknowledge Please. what I've heard that um, as a person myself who survived mental health issues and who now is a provider of treatment and working with people, and I'm also an activist working with people to change the systems that caused a lot of the problems we have, that right. I just want to acknowledge that um, something that I think Greg said about how it's a spiritual thing, about how connecting with people, how we don't always, how we don't always know why it works, but it works. And I think right. we need to honor that, that as human beings, like, we're not meant to handle things alone. And when we're cut off from people, it's hard and that we actually do need other people to heal. And, like, and that's how we're wired as humans. If you look at the science too, not just our spirit, but like what science is showing us. And so sure. the work that you all are doing is so important because in the end, people need people and you deserve to be paid for what you're doing as much as it's the right thing to do. And we all should just do the right thing for each other. 
you're you're dedicating a lot of time and it's an important piece of the system of care and you deserve to be paid and you deserve to be funded more for the work that you're doing at Psychiatric Survivors Cream. So I just want to acknowledge that. And, you know, we are 11 out of 150 House members who are yeah. part of 180 people. Yeah. But, but, but I am one out of 11 who will continue to advocate for you and, and just want to express gratitude for everything that you have done and just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Representative Peterson, I see your hand is still up or is that, yep, nope. And Representative Goldman, same, is your hand up again? No, okay. Um, no, same. I'd like to ask a question that that's a new hand. Um, sorry oh. if I put it up. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your work. It sounds really important. Um, we're and I'm new to the mental health system, um, so thank you for your your um, perspective. We are hearing a lot about designated agencies that exist throughout the state. In my area, it's HCRS, um, and I'm just wondering: is there a relationship that you have with designated agencies? And is that a potential source of funding for you, or does that not make any sense at all? <clears throat> so great, great question. So I, I'll just paint you a small picture, give an example. So I, I worked for two years for Rutland Mental Health um, as their first peer support specialist on their crisis team. So I actually went out, met people in the community, worked with the police, did everything you know with the crisis team. So this is big controversy around the peer world and the clinical world. Um, who does it? Who has, who has the, the best you know solution? Who does it the best? I believe that everybody plays a role. I believe the clinical person plays a role. The peer support person also plays a role. So my my intention in being the executive director for VPS is to bridge that gap, to make the collaborative connection that says, why are we fighting? Why can't we come together and meet in the middle to figure out what needs to be done? So to answer your question as well, I have great connections with other DAs that I've, I've been working with. It, it, you know, again, during this pandemic, it's been, it's been very hard to, you know, not be able to go in the hospitals, but still work with people while they're in the hospitals. So it, it was a it was a big struggle to get our our ta our tablets and our um and to figure out how to get the money to even purchase you know, tablets to go into the facilities. You know, we had to kind of do a lot of penny pension, you know, but yeah, there are, there are organizations who are willing and have, have been connecting with us. There are some who have not, you know, but we're working on it. The retreat um, is doing their best. There are still struggles there. There is still a lot of work to be done with the retreat, but we have some kind of momentum. We still want to understand why bathrooms are locked. You know, we still want to have get we answers to that. We don't know yet but that is happening. And if there is a reason for that, I think the public and the people should know why bathrooms are being locked as an example. So again, collaborate, collaborations are, are possible, are happening, and I am definitely all for it. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this has uh, been, as is often the case, the most powerful testimony comes from people whose lives have been directly impacted. Uh, and this is, I think, been demonstrated again this afternoon. Uh, I have you. a question too for you guys. Oh, oh you do? Okay, fine. Yeah. No, I was, I was, well, I'm fine. sorry, just one, one question, one question. Sure. Um, and any, anybody can answer it, it's free for all. Um, so, and maybe this is a hard question, but I'm gonna go for it. You go for it. What is the consensus in your group right now of support for whatever I, I just if someone could just say you know because the community is very unaware um of what the conversation is you know but if, if, if someone can just maybe describe real briefly what is it that this committee wants to do for people like peer, that that are, are have the experience or the, the disconnect between da's in the peer world what is it that you guys want want to have happen well, it's a great question, and it's the question that we need to address ourselves. And we haven't had that <laughs> conversation. No, to be honest, Kareem, we haven't. For, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of information. We're a brand new committee. Uh, we, we first started getting together like four weeks ago, five weeks ago now. 
Okay. So we've been we've been getting to know there are new members to the committee for whom this is brand new information. There's commit there's folks in the committee who've been committed to peer support for years uh, and have lived experience. And so we have so we're in the process of listening. And then we're going to have to turn to the point where we're going to say, okay, next week, we're going to start talking about money and the budget and what we're willing to advocate for and what we, what are our priorities gotcha. and peer support is going to be one of those questions. So I can't answer that for you conclusively right now, but I can say this, that I think you have a number of members of this committee who already have been committed to support for peer support. Uh, in years past and are very, continue to be very sympathetic. I think this committee may be one of the most supportive places you're going to find in the whole legislature. Okay, uh, let's go. <laughs> I, seriously, but I don't want to pre, I don't want to prejudge what, what our priorities because there's a lot of people who need a lot from us. But this is, uh, I think for some of us, uh, high on the list of priorities. So, awesome. and I, I will, I think when we get to that point, I think we should communicate back to you. And uh, I, I will be all ears and ready and ready to go. Okay, good. Thank you for I asking. Will, so, thank you for asking that very directly. Yes, I, th I, thank I, you for the opportunity and um, for all the new uh, members. Um, thank you, and just I hope that everything you heard today really um, will persuade you um, um, in a way of. of uh, different kind of support other than just hospitals getting the support. Because again, there are other organizations doing some great work and we it, we should not have to fight over the same pool of money to do some alternative different support work. Yeah, so Kareem, I see that Representative Page has a question. Uh, oh, you, you really go for did, it. Let's take another question, uh, Representative Page. No, I'm all done with questions for the day, I can't. I can't do it. Go, go. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm just joking. You got to pay him more before he'll answer. One more question, it'll cost us. Well, that's that's my question. It is about money. All um, right. And and you did talk about some sort of pot um, fund. Uh, pot grants. Yep. Yes. Could you? T do we have any idea how much um, that grant was for? Sure. Sure. Yep. So the, the pot grants and the support grants are a few grand. Um, where where people are uh, have to meet criterias on, for example, running a group or having some kind of um, um, work related to survivors and how they can support survivors. You know, they, we have another group where people are looking to do artwork um, to support people through their trauma, you know, so we will reimburse them. Um, we would love to be able to give them the money to get it going, but we don't have the funding like that. So they have, we reimburse them. They submit an invoice. Um, so that's, that's how it goes right now. That's how it's been for a while. We don't really like it. We work with what we have. Um, but again, like you just met, you, you, heard, you heard from Greg and, and Annette, they have an amazing group. They used to be supported and we want to support them more, but we can't in that way, you know? So again, just another reason to say we need the funding to do these. And remember, that's only one group. We have multiple groups going around the state. Okay, so you heard from one, you heard from two amazing people um, out of a whole bunch that we have. So I'm gonna just, I'm just in monitoring this. I know AJ Rubin is with us and I, I had heard indirectly from AJ that he had said, look, if, if, if I need to get bumped in order to hear fully from the folks who are actually doing the peer support oh. work. So I, he's, he's hanging in there. I, hey, AJ. Uh, but, uh, but I do wanna, you know, Check in with him and maybe give him a little bit of time still. But Ian, you had a no. Elizabeth, Representative Barrows had a question. Then I, Representative Don here. Or Representative Don, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks. I just wanted to, if that was the question, Woody, uh, Kareem, it's about three thousand dollars. Yes, correct. Back that that a group would get as a pop grant, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. May I ask? Um, may I say something about our pop grants for Greg and I? Um, sure. My group social club on Friday, there was like 25. The first half was games. The second half was a meal. And I didn't do, I did good food, salad. Um, we had everything from goulash or spaghetti to stuffed pork chops, baked chicken, a real healthy meal, and then desserts and beverages. This pop grant 
even with that and running this stuff in prizes. And then with Greg's group, the same thing. We were able to really pinch our pennies, and we were able to stretch that money for five days a week for these groups. And we also did a basket bingo a couple of years in a row when we, we raised a lot of money for our groups. Of course, this year we couldn't do it. But that pop gant to us is really essential to keep these going because we are on limited income now. And it, it's just hard. It's very hard. But this is so, so needed. And it's not just for us. It's for all the 25 that we're still connecting with Monday through Friday and even on the weekends. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to turn to Representative Barrows and Burroughs, and then and then we're, I think we're going to stop for uh, with psychiatric Vermont psychiatric survivors. And uh, but Representative Burroughs, you have a question. And she's not on the screen because of her internet. Yeah. I, again, I apologize about my internet. No um, uh, I I would like you to clarify just a, a briefly um, about the the uh, seclusion and restraint. Um, just so that I get it square in my mind, your, your group goes in and they talk with patients who have been through seclusion and restraint at facilities, is that right? At the designated? Right, so sometimes that is the case. So, you know, on behalf of VPS, we are totally against restraints. We, right. we think that there are other alternatives um, other than restraining someone. We believe that when a person comes into a facility, if they need to, that they have some input and some say in how they are treated if they get to the, a level of where they need that extra support. But to make a decision for them where you have to put hands on and restrain them in a way that they're uncomfortable with, um, there are other alternatives. Um, so if, if that helped to help answer the question, we go in, if someone says they didn't like how they were treated, uh, the patient representative will kind of investigate, ask questions, kind of get to the bottom, go through the grievance process to find out if the, if the grievance process was uh, uh, done correctly from beginning to end and resolved. So, you know, we, we play that role as well. Um, and the, the patients there know that. They know that they have a representative at VPS and that is our role while we're there also to support them when they leave. Okay. Does that help? Yes, right. that is, okay. But um, what, on your list of, of uh, issues of concern, you, okay. also, you also mentioned um, uh, that the seclusion and restraint is not reviewed by the, the um, DMH. Is that also, did I hear that wrong? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there is no review mechanism that, that we believe in. We think that it should be more. <laughs> And Donahue can can talk more to that if she wants. I see your hand going up, but I think that's a normal conversation, <laughs> honestly. No, I just wanted to clarify. They do for involuntary patients, but if you're Correct. a voluntary patient and you're restrained or seclusion secluded, it is not part of the oversight. Oh. Wow. Okay. Not yet. Not, there you go. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Right. Check the bills on your. Wall. Thank and, you. And that, and that is that is definitely a bigger conversation for yeah. a, a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, well, I appreciate you clarifying that for me. I thought I heard that correctly. I just, it, yeah, I wish you could see my face right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Well, listen, thank you, thank you guys. I appreciate this time and um, hope to hear from you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You've you. been terrific. Thank you. And uh, right. thank you to Annette and to... I'm, Greg. Greg, thank you, Annette and Greg. Thank you, Annette and Greg, as well as All right. everyone. Okay. Uh, AJ, I want to just check in with you. It's, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be candid here, AJ. I'm not sure there's anything you can say at this point after a long day that's going to top what we just heard. And that's not to say that we don't want to hear from you, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest and say, I like to perhaps invite you back at a different point in time. I think we might uh, do well to uh, either invite you to, no, I'm, it's my best judgment right now. I'm going to exercise it as the chair. I think we should say thank you. Uh, and I think to, I think we should, we should uh, finish our testimony and ask you if you might come back. 
Whatever, I'm at your service. <laughs> no, I, I say, I say, I, and I say that with full respect because I just think that it's been a really long day. And my experience is that it's often good to just when you've heard powerful testimony, to not to not get in the way of it. And I think, and that's, and that's, I think that what. So, I'm, I'm, I'm I'd be happy to have a conversation with you offline about that. Oh, oh as as you noted, um, I understood this was a possibility, and I am. A, a big supporter of, of, of emphasizing the peer role. And I am grateful that your committee took this up. And I agree, it was very powerful. And I'm at your service as your mental health care ombudsperson uh, under, under Ed. So um, please invite me back at your, whenever it's convenient. And thank you for your time. We will. And, uh, and we will want people to know about the role you play. But uh, I think this is, this is the right decision from my point of view right now. Thank you, AJ, for your service and for your understanding about that. My pleasure. So, um, so folks, I think we've had a, we've had a very full day uh, and a very, a very long day, a very full day. And I honestly think uh, it's a good thing for us to call it to a close right now uh, and thank the folks, everyone who's testified for us today. Uh, and Dan, I see you're still maybe on the line with us. Thank you, Dan. I want to acknowledge your important testimony as well earlier. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to suggest that we uh, adjourn for the day. Uh, then we're back on tomorrow morning uh, as a committee after the floor. And what you're going to be experiencing more and more of is how we have to move from topic to topic uh, and we're going to come back to our deliberations now on audio only, which uh, Representative Houghton has been continuing to work on following our committee discussion yesterday, work on with uh, Jen Carvey. And uh, Lori's going to lead us through some review of where, where we are with that uh, tomorrow morning. Is that, we're, on, we're on line for, in line for that? Yep. Yes, uh, we are. OK. Um, and then uh, we, we have rescheduled Julie Tesler to the afternoon. Uh, I realize it's, a, it's gonna be a long Friday as well, but I think it's important for us to hear from Julie about the designated agencies. We heard a lot from the department. We've now heard a lot from peer support and some others who are doing other important work. Uh, and I think, that, I think all of that will stand us in good stead for then looking at budget issues as we come back to issues around the mental health system of care uh, next week.